Good evening, everyone. We're about to get started. The Yukon Science Institute is a non for profit organization that seeks to promote public awareness in science activities in the Yukon and to facilitate research and development. As part of our mandate, YSI coordinate this lecture series. YSI is funded by the Yukon Department of Tourism and Culture Heritage Branch and Environment Yukon and supported by the Yukon Beringia Interpretive Center. This year, for the first time in over 15 years, We've had to raise our membership fees in order to keep bringing new and innovative perspective on science to Yukoners. Please join. We'd really appreciate the support, and with it, you'll receive emails about upcoming lectures. Also, please note that tonight's lecture is being video recorded. Tonight, Ernie Prokopchuk will be delivering the lecture, Wizard Oil, Science in the Age of Social Media. Originally from Thunder Bay, Ontario, Ernie completed a BSc in chemistry at Lakehead University before completing a PhD at University of Western Ontario, specializing in organometallic chemistry and a postdoc at Queen's University. From there, he moved to Manitoba where he was an assistant professor in the chemistry department at the University of Winnipeg from 2004 to 2011 teaching second year organic chemistry and second, third, and fourth year inorganic chemistry courses. During that time, he led a research program looking at preparing novel ionic liquids and then transition metal catalysts for oxidative desulfurization. <laughs> right. <laughs> In 2011, he moved to Whitehorse to become an instructor at Yukon College. He now teaches the university transfer first year chemistry and second year organic chemistry courses there. All right, Ernie. Great, thank you. Well, thank you for having me here tonight and, and thank you all for braving the, the cold weather to uh, come out. It's great to see everyone here. Um, get wizard oil. Uh, a bit about this uh, picture here, Hamlin's Wizard Oil. Uh, the Hamlin Brothers, about 1861-ish or so, came out with this wizard oil. It's supposed to cure uh, rheumatism, a variety of other things, toothache, diphtheria, lame back, and so on. Uh, the stuff contained, it was mostly alcohol, 50-70% uh, alcohol, uh, uh, chloroform, uh, turpentine, cloves, um, ammonia, all kinds of stuff in there. And you can take it externally or, or internally. I don't recommend it. Right, but this would go around, you know, those traveling medicine shows, you know, and they'd travel the Midwest and they'd have the entertainment and then someone would hawk this, this, this miracle cure. And I think those traveling medicine shows kind of bear a bit of a resemblance to social media nowadays. You know, you go on, you get all the entertainment, and then every once in a while a posting pops up where somebody's got this great miracle cure, right? So kind of a bit of a parallel there. Before we get uh, into the, the, the content-wise, just, of course, classic disclaimer, um, right, my own opinions. My own opinions based on my best understanding of the current evidence and scientific you know, uh, data available. Right? So science is an evolving thing. Occasionally new uh, results come out that you have to reconsider. Based on what the state of the science is now, what I, my understanding of it is, will then, of course, be what I explain to you and, and express my opinions based on. Uh, right, and that's the way science works. So, right, the, you know, in case anyone's got a favorite product that happens to come up and, you know, so. All right, I'm gonna start off, uh, not so much into the chemicals, chemistry end of it, but uh, the magic of magnets, right? Magnets, go back to your childhood, right? And magnets are great, you stick together, ooh, pull them apart, you know, and they stick to the fridge. There's just something really neat about magnets. And that fascination goes further than just playing with them and holding, you know, kids' artwork to the fridge. Um, there's a variety of miracle cures out there involving magnets, and even major retailers uh, sell these magnetic bracelets. So an ad from you know, Walmart.com 
talking about magnetic therapy bracelets, uh, talking about it producing small electric currents uh, to help then with the release of endorphins. Thing is, I mean, you've got this magnet, and yeah, we can use magnets to generate electric currents. I mean, that's how generators work. But you need a, a changing magnetic field across, you know, a, a loop of conductor. I don't know about you, but my arm is not made out of copper wire. Um, and then the magnet's just sitting there. So it, you see this, this, this trend throughout these kinds of things being marketed, where they try to, they take bits of tr real true science, but then you take it out of context. Right? So throughout, we'll see examples of that, where there's some real information, real data there, um, real theory, just not used quite the right way. Now, another way we see these magnetic bracelets come up and explained is in terms of our blood. Uh, here's a diagram explaining how they work. See, without it, your blood's all clogged up and all disorderly. With the magnetic field, your blood is all lined up like good little school children lined up for recess, right? Um, and it's all based on the idea that magnets attract iron, our blood has iron, therefore they right, should work. Um, there's a problem with that. There's a big, unless you've got iron you know, filings coursing through your veins, um, the iron you're really dealing with is you know, trapped in hemoglobin. Uh, this is a hemoglobin structure, so these things that look like Christmas ribbons right, are just sort of the general protein structure. The part I wanna focus on are these heme units, four of them, in a hemoglobin. And what you've got is this type of structure. A uh, quick word about structure, just in case you know, it's been a while. Um, the way these lines are drawn up, it reduces clutter. So every corner, bend, intersection, there's a carbon atom, ends of lines, carbon atoms, um, nitrogens, other atoms, elements are indicated if they're not carbon. Um, hydrogen around the bout as needed to make four bonds at any one of these carbons. What I want to focus on is the iron aspect of it, however, this guy right here. Now, the basic idea is this iron is uh, plus two oxidation state in the uh, heme unit. Uh, it actually sits slightly above the, the porphyrin ring when there's no oxygen attached. Now, in 1936, um, Linus Pauling and co-worker whose name, whew, gone, um, found and determined that there are magnetic properties associated with that due to four unpaired electrons on that iron, right? Uh, having unpaired electrons means it's paramagnetic. What that means to us is it's very, very weakly attracted to a magnetic field. Okay, fine. Oxygen uh, comes in, it binds to the uh, iron, uh, comes in the top, binds to the iron. Actually, the iron settles into the ring at that point. It's neat because that triggers some changes in the protein structure that actually then makes the other heme units uh, more reactive to incoming oxygen. So really kind of neat stuff. Key for us at this point is when that happens, there's a change in the iron that all the electrons become paired up. It becomes what we call diamagnetic. And diamagnetic substances are very weakly repelled by a magnetic field. The key word here is weakly. Uh, these are much weaker effects than your fridge magnet. Okay, so these are not strong effects at all. So a couple things to keep in mind. One, if indeed the magnets were influencing the iron in your blood, it would be to attract all the deoxygenated blood to your wrist and push all the oxygenated blood away. Probably not a good thing, but thankfully it's such a weak effect, it's not going to be able to overpower just you know, the blood circulating anyways. Uh, if in doubt, next time you cut yourself, see if you can clean up the mess with a magnet. I guarantee you it will not work. But magnets aren't just good for you know, your circulation. Um, apparently they will do your laundry. Um, and this is one that pops up frequently in uh, my wife's uh, Facebook feed, and these laundry magnets. And there's a few things about this. First of all, once again, magnets, right? Everyone's familiar with them. They're safe. They're, you know, uh, something we think we understand. Um, freedom from chemicals, save money and your health in the environment. First, I've got to say, that whole chemical-free idea, every time somebody says chemical-free, a test tube dies, all right? Uh, everything around us is chemical. The water you're doing your laundry in is chemical. Your laundry is chemical. The dirt's chemical. The foods you eat are chemical. We are walking collections of chemicals. Right? So chem chemical-free is kind of a nonsense phrase. Right? If it's chemical-free, you just there's nothing there. Right? So, sorry, rant over. Um, but some things, uh, clipping straight from the web page, uh, this magnetic laundry web page. 
just some things I wanted to point out. Talking about uh, saving the environment, using less water, costing you uh, less, you know, and that's great. The idea being if you're not using detergent, you don't have to rinse cycle and you use less water. Okay, fair enough. Um, but then they talk about, well, these are, must, you know, these are great because they're patented and independently proven. And the thing is, with patents, you don't need to prove that the thing works. All you need to prove is that you thought of it first. And not even that. You need to prove that you submitted the patent before anybody else who thought of it. That's what patents are. So if I really wanted to, I could patent a magnetic levitating harness for reindeer for improving present delivery. And if I was willing to spend the money, I could get a patent on that, provided nobody else has already. So the whole has patented doesn't really mean much. Independently proven, okay, that's kind of neat. Well, by who and what did they prove? Turns out on another website, they had a link through to some lab reports uh, of having these things tested. Uh, it says in the small print, you know, not to be used for promotional purposes, but they've got the link, so hey. And uh, a lab, an independent lab, did do a test. They took some dirty fabric, ran it through the machine, and used spectral photometers to measure light reflecting off the fabric and said, okay, yeah, you know, the laundry came out cleaner than when it went in. Okay. There's nothing, though, comparing it to regular detergent, nothing comparing it even to just plain water. Just, the other stuff's less dirty. Not really informative, right? Um, the fact that you were washing your family's laundry with you know, crude oil-derived petrochemicals may disturb you. Not really. A and I'll get to that in a moment, why not really? Uh, then they throw in, once again, to reinforce that, ooh, scary chemicals, right? The definition of detergent, Right, similar to soap made from petrochemical compounds. That's actually a pretty good definition. That's what detergents are. But that's not a bad thing. Uh, the thing with molecules and chemicals is they don't subscribe to Ancestry.ca. They don't know where they came from. It doesn't make a difference. It's the structure of the molecule and how it behaves that's the key thing, not the source. So a bit about um, this idea of that, I mean, going back to the beginnings of organic chemistry, it was believed that there was something special about organic molecules. Right? They were only found in living organisms. Uh, they were unique compared to the other common chemicals that were familiar at the time. So the thought was there must be some vital force, something special about things that came out of living critters. Right? Uh, 1816, some experiments showing that, well, wait a minute, you can take soap and react it with acid and get fatty acids back. So soap top, reacting it with an acid and fatty acid, organic molecule. Now, all right, admittedly, the soap was made from fats in the first place, so we could argue that you're really just staying within that same loop. Okay, fine. 1828, uh, Friedrich Wohler discovers that you can convert ammonium cyanate to urea, inorganic salt, heated up organic molecule. He didn't have to feed it to monkeys, it just worked. Right? Really sort of making that point that it's not the source. There's nothing special or magical about the chemical having come out of a plant or an animal. Right? We now understand the whole field of organic chemistry to just be that of uh, carbon compounds. It's really just a man-made division of chemistry. Right? So we take out that whole you know, it's different because it's from a living critter aspect of it. Now, coming back to the idea of, of structure being so important, right, the functionality, how a chemical behaves, comes down to structure, not source, right? Take, for example, vitamin C. Um, just a model. So the blues in this case are the carbons, oxygens, there's white for hydrogen. Uh, the modeling of the software doesn't throw in the double bonds, but it gives you an idea of shape. And what I want to point out is that this idea of functionality and structure being tied together can really be affected by very subtle changes in structure. Right? Take the same molecule, so vitamin C, it's you know, antioxidant, it's got um, some coenzyme um, functionality. Change the structure a little bit, and you get this other uh, isomer of ascorbic acid. And the only changes here are you take this carbon, see how it's sort of coming forward towards us, and this oxygen and hydrogen come forwards? Here, that's all going back a bit. This carbon here, uh, see that hydrogen's pointing to the back, this case, it's coming out to the front. They're, they're mirror images, is what they are. They're a special kind. They're what we call enantiomers. They are mirror images, much like your hands, right? Mirror images. 
but non-superimposable. Right? I can't lay them on top of each other because they don't line up. Right? Same thing with these, these enantiomers. And the neat thing about that very, very subtle difference in structure is that, yeah, you know, they'll melt at the same temperature, they dissolve in the same solvents, but biologically, this one does not show any of the coenzyme behavior. Right? It's the wrong structure. Okay, so really tight tie in there. And it's not just in something like uh, the ascorbic acid example. Uh, a classic example, uh, an unfortunate example, is thalidomide. Right? Originally developed for treating uh, respiratory infections, they discovered that, hey, look, it can help treat morning sickness too. It never underwent proper testing. At the time, they didn't have the same testing protocols we have now. Right? But it didn't undergo testing to see, well, what does it do to a developing fetus? Right? So the, what we call the R enantiomer, this structure here, is the effective uh, pharmaceutical. Right? It's the one that has the action and treats. All we do is change the structure to this carbon, move this nitrogen group, this group here, to the back, bring this hydrogen from the back to the front, you've got the mirror image. This is a teratogen. Right? It causes, it affects the development of the fetus, right? it causes birth defects. Right? So what happened, I don't have gone proper testing, you have then you know, babies being born with underdeveloped arms, internal organ problems, and so on. Right? quickly banned, not used that way. Currently, actually, it's used for treating things like um, leprosy, uh, some complications from HIV, certain myelomas. So it still has a use, just don't give it to pregnant women. Right? And even if you were to separate these two, this is a weird example because at physiological pH, these will interconvert. So even if you start off with pure of the R version, the S version will develop. So. Right, once again, very subtle difference in structure, completely different results. Okay? So structure and functionality tied really close together, not source, structure. Okay? So structure matters. Um, but I mean, what's, yeah, fine, but natural things must be safer, right? Nature's good, we love nature, right? Living in the Yukon especially. Well, yeah, I mean, I understand why people would say that, because of course, black widow spiders, perfectly safe. Um, this is uh, Lake Nyos in um, Cameroon. Uh, perfectly natural, high carbon dioxide content in the lake. For hundreds, thousands of years, carbon dioxide levels building up deep in the lake due to volcanic activity. One night in 1986, something happened to cause an inversion in the lake. That CO2 rich water rose up, pressure, of course, dropping at that point, the CO2 was expelled from the lake. Killed every living thing other than the plants in a 25 kilometer radius. 1,700 people you know, dead in their sleep. Completely natural, right? But, you know, these things happen. So they've now they've put in fountains to kind of try to bring the deep water up and try to keep the CO2 levels down. But there's several lakes um, in that area that have that same sort of uh, problem. Right? Uh, this here, example of uh, galena, right? Lead ore, so lead's natural, don't eat it. Uh, cobra venom, cobras are natural. This is an arsenic silver ore, arsenic's natural. Um, but you know, if you've got natural arsenic and your groundwater's passing through it, you now have arsenic enriched water, not really good. Right? Uh, so in Bangladesh, they've got wells where high in arsenic level, just naturally. Okay. Leads to discoloration of the skin, uh, circulatory problems, cancers, all natural. Right? So the whole natural is good argument doesn't play out. Right? So it, it's just thinking beyond the sort of Common, uh, common ideas, right? Um, so going back to the whole laundry detergent magnet idea, uh, let's look at functionality here. Uh, surfactants is the key component of washing our laundry. It's the thing that bridges between the polar water and the non-polar dirt, grease, oils, and such. Right? Traditionally, soap would have been the way to do it, right? You take an animal fat, hit it with some sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide perhaps, and you cleave these, uh, these linkages and you end up with uh, glycerol and soap. Key idea here then is you have this polar end to the molecule, so negative charge on it. Uh, this is going to interact very strongly with your polar water, right? So it allows the soap to dissolve in water. On the other hand, you have this long nonpolar, or we call hydrophobic end, and it's going to interact very well with the nonpolar grease oils. So when you're cleaning dishes or your laundry, the long non polar end 
sort of groups around your oil or your grease. You're left with the shell on the outside of the polar bit. So we call it a micelle. And this then allows the water to wash away your oil and your grease. That's how soaps function. The only problem with that is that group on the end. If you've got hard water, this will bind quite nicely to magnesium, calcium ions, and you get an insoluble scum. And that's not very useful. So we change the ends up a bit. This is where detergents come in. So detergents, we've changed it up. So we have these sulfate groups, benzyl sulfate. And now you've got an end that when magnesium or calcium ions bind to it, well, they don't. It stays soluble. Right? So now we can use these in harder water. You notice this structural feature here is still the same idea that we had in the soaps. So we get that same functionality, right? structure and function. Uh, in terms of environmental impact, as long as these are straight chain alkanes, uh, alkyl groups, they're still biodegradable. Um, early detergents, there's a lot of branching coming off that main chain, and those were not biodegradable. Right? So we see that you know, the structural features affecting how it behaves. So these are the kinds of things involved with cleaning our laundry. These are these detergents, these scary petrochemical derived surfactants. Right? So that's how detergent works. Well, what about the magnets? There's got to be an explanation for them if they work so well. Well, from that same web page, just pulled some clippings, uh, right? Unique means of water maintenance. I don't know what that means. Universal solvent, and we're improving the solvency of water. Universal solvent, uh, term you hear frequently. Maybe it means something different to different people. Personally, I think universal solvent, I expect it to dissolve everything, right? Now, I've always wondered, if you've got a universal solvent, what do you put it in? Right. Of course, water doesn't dissolve everything. Right? Fats and oils, grease, good example right there. Um, so, you know, but it's a common idea you hear. Um, you know, this is the whole dispelling the myth. Well, as I saw, it's not really a myth. Detergents are detergents. There's no hidden secret there. It certainly implies something, though. Shh, they don't want you to know. Right? It brings up that whole kind of feeling of, okay, someone's doing something sneaky. Right? Um, petrochemical products. Oh, magnetism, one of the most powerful forces on Earth. You know, and the whole uh, fridge magnet will defy the force of gravity. Well, that's impressive. Try taking your fridge magnet, and can you lift your fridge with it? Right? It's a matter of scale, right? Magnets work well in their case, but right, gravity between two large objects. Right? So that's a pretty meaningless statement. But you see it everywhere. And I've seen it on just genuine just science websites as well. Right, so, um, right, but you know, yay magnets. Uh, these magnets last forever. Apparently they're renewable. I, I take a, a bit of exception to that. The magnet's not gonna wear out. Granted, right, this will last. You can will it to your grandchildren and right, the magnet will do its thing. But renewable, I mean, once you dig up the rare earths you're using in the magnets, I mean, it's like saying gold or copper's renewable, right? It, it's not gonna grow back. So, um, I, th I see what they're trying to get at, but yeah, no, not quite, right? So, that's the sum of the things. But notice, nothing in this explains how it works. Now, it turns out there's another website selling the exact same product. There's, there's many of them. Uh, but this other website has got a neat little infomercial style video that plays when you go there uh, at Water Liberty, and they explain how they believe these things work. First off, these magnets are really strong, 390 times stronger than your fridge magnet. Right, think of all the artwork that'll hold up. Um, but they also link, have a link to the patent. And when you look at the patent, it talks about using magnets of at least 3,900 Gauss or 0.39 Tesla. Right? I did the conversion there. Not that hard. Um, all right, well, what does that mean? Well, your typical fridge magnets are about 0.005 Tesla. Uh, my math might be a little rusty, but that's only about 80 times different. That's fine, the patent was f accepted in 2000, filed in 1997. They're probably using better magnets now. So all right, why there, right? Uh, just for a comparison, MRIs, like they have in the hospital, uh, one and a half to three Tesla. Uh, experimental MRIs, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometers tend to get up, can get as high as, you know, 15, 20 Tesla. So 
there are much stronger magnets out there when you get into superconducting magnets. So anyways, that's what the patents is they're doing. Uh, then apparently, according to this infomercial, uh, the magnets will change the surface tension of the water. Right? They'll make the water um, spread out and slippery. Interesting, because they're sort of tying back to surfactants here. Surfactants do affect surface tension. They reduce it. That's why you get soap bubbles. So they're making the claim that the magnets will do a similar sort of thing. And I thought, it seemed weird. It just felt weird. I thought, let's, let's check, check, right? Well, it turns out magnets will affect surface tension of water. Now, a 10 Tesla field, all right, so we're already way beyond what these magnets are doing, right, increases surface tension by only less than 2%. So really strong magnets, really small change in the wrong direction. So right, magnetic fields uh, in your laundry, no. No, no. Now, if you've got nails, iron filings in your laundry, all right, you know. Um, but interestingly enough, you take a look at the patent, and it goes further. Apparently, these magnets are going to start messing around with your water, um, just like particle accelerators. And well, the thing is, strong magnets in particle accelerators, uh, mass spectrometers, are there to, to guide your charged particles. They don't create the charged particles. A charged particle moving through a magnetic field will experience a force perpendicular to its motion. It, it curves. Um, they go in charged. Or in the case uh, of a mass spectrometer, we blast it with an electron beam and create the ions. Okay, so no, we're not starting to rip our water molecules apart with magnets. Uh, they go on. Apparently, it's going to uh, get negatively charged oxygen ions. I can only assume. They're talking about forming some sort of oxide, which would react with water anyways, and you get a basic solution. If that did happen, all right, well, that base reacts with oils and fats. You create soap. Hmm. But what's it reacting with? I mean, magnets can't do that. We need a strong base to take those hydrogens off, maybe a strong reducing agent like sodium metal. Not really magnets. Interestingly, it does turn out that there are research groups working on selective electrolysis, electric current, um, and certain catalysts involving things like platinum or gold, mercury, uh, palladium, and trying to form uh, peroxide. But that's in the presence of you know, electricity, not magnets. So uh, really creative. You know, it's in the patent. It's not happening. Now, talking about the idea of those hydroxides, basic solutions. Alkaline water has got to be a really popular thing. Right? You can find it sold in bottles. The, you know, online, it's like, ooh, amazing new water. Drink this water. It'll you know, fix everything for you. Um, it's kind of a weird thing. It's really popular. Kind of a head scratcher. Uh, idea of alkaline water, when you read about them, it contains alkalizing compounds. Interesting term. Um, they talk about calcium and silicon, potassium, magnesium bicarbonate. I'm assuming they're talking about the cations of those metals. Not really sure what the silicon's doing. Um, and that's fine, OK. I mean, you could have potassium hydroxide in your water. Uh, if you were to drop potassium metal in your water, it's going to, well, cause fire first. And then you do get basic solution, alkaline solution, potassium hydroxide. So all right, uh, pH scale here on the side just as a reference. Right, so it's only like baking soda, it's about a nine. If they're talking about bicarbonates, we're talking baking soda. Right, so fine, you can have an alkaline solution. Don't know why you really would want to. I mean, these ads and stuff you know, claim that it's going to prevent acidosis. Um, turns out acidosis is, tends to be caused by a variety of health problems, diabetes, dehydration, kidney disease, poisoning. Um, the dehydration one I thought was interesting, because then you drink lots of the alkaline water, and if of course you're fixed, because you just solved the dehydration problem. Right? Um, so that's the claims they're making. Uh, the thing is, our bodies naturally regulate pH anyways. It's all buffered systems. It's all controlled. Um, if you have a health problem, then maybe it doesn't work so well, in which case you need to treat the problem and not just you know, drink base. So these are pretty big and popular. But apparently, if you want the really good stuff, you buy an ionizer. So water ionizers, there's a bunch of them out there. Once again, they pop up. And the kicker is you start trying to look up and figure out what are these things doing? And all you do are get pages and pages of Google hits that are all selling water ionizers. 
Right? So it's really tough to actually dig out uh, the information behind them, right? try to find out what's really going on. So uh, the idea I'm here, they're going to create healthy water. It uh, goes through a car carbon filter. Well, that's fine. I mean, I drink filtered water, not because I don't trust the water. It just removes a little bit of the taste, and you know, I like that. But you know, that's fine. You don't have to. Our water's perfectly safe here in this town, right? Um, but then they're going to you know, electrolyze it. OK, fine. Electrolysis is the process of taking water, uh, right, applying a potential, and you get hydrogen at one electrode, oxygen at the other. You do get your basic solution at one end, acidic at the other. Do it in one big container, and these will just mix back together anyways. Right? Um, what are they going to do here? They're going to remove, apparently, all kinds of things for you, um, get the high pH, easily microclusters, yeah. I mean, water, OK, you've got a molecule. It is interacting with neighboring molecules. There's nothing there for it to cause clusters, right? Water molecules are moving around at room temperature. They're not going to sit there in a little group huddled together against the cold. Now you start freezing it and getting ice crystals. That's a different thing. Right? Uh, interestingly enough, you can buy uh, products that claim to create rigid water structures and clusters and things that are supposed to be good for you. Uh, so you got some you know, debates there, I guess. But that doesn't make any sense. We don't expect it. Now, you've got ions in water. What will happen is ions will form hydration spheres around, or so water will form hydration spheres around ions. Right? And you get water that kind of moves in a group around an ion. You know, a bunch of groupies following the rock star through the solution. Right? Um, so, I mean, that's the claims they're making. Um, to do separating those. Yeah, so they're pretty much discarding the acidic end, keeping the basic end. You're throwing out half your water is what it amounts to. Um, you know, so much for that water you were saving with your laundry magnets, right? Uh, antioxidant properties, apparently. I hate to break it to you. Hydroxide's a good base. It's not an antioxidant. Um, if the hydroxide were to come across and react with a radical, and if that hydroxide gave one of its electrons up to the radical, you've just created a hydroxyl radical. The radical's still there. Right? So, no, this is not going to replace your vitamin C. I recommend orange juice. Um, so that's you know the claims they're making. And there's other sites selling these things. And the claims are very similar in, in many of these cases. Uh, once you have water clusters coming in there, we're going to hydrate you better. I mean, we evolved drinking just the water that's naturally occurring. I don't think clustering issues is really that much of a problem. Uh, we've got, oh, this one's great. right? You've got these hydroxides. They're oxygen rich right? Uh, with water. Oxygen is 16 eighteenths of a mass of a water molecule. With hydroxide, you're 16 seventeenths the mass. So I guess that's oxygen rich. Um, the thing is, hydroxide is not O2, right? Oxygen gas. They're not going to perform the same function, right? The hydroxide ions are not going to give you oxygen to your blood and do everything that oxygen does. It's a different species completely. Right? So, kind of a, an interesting claim. Um, there's, once again, neutralizing radicals, apparently. And, oh, the buffers, yeah. Apparently, uh, because you're getting extra calcium, drinking your ionized water, you're going to be able to buffer acids better. All right. Buffers are, are an important thing. I, you know, our body, I said, is pH controlled. There are buffers, buffering processes. Buffering is all about keeping pH within a very narrow window. Uh, some examples we could make up in a lab would be things like acetic acid and sodium acetate. Right? Sodium acetate is the stuff in your salt and vinegar chips. You, know? um, right? you can make a buffer. It's got a pH of about 4.6. Uh, if you use ammonium chloride and ammonia, you have about 9.4. Right? So just a couple. There's hundreds of examples of buffers. Right? And the idea being that these buffer solutions will react with both acids and bases, as the case may be. Right? So if you throw in some base, your acetic acid reacts with it, neutralizes it. Throw in acid, then the acetate will react with it, neutralize it. Calcium ions, on the other hand, are not buffers. If you throw a base in, yeah, it'll react. You'll get uh, calcium hydroxide will form. Throw an acid in, nothing's going to happen with the calcium. Right? It's not a buffer. So I don't, I'm not sure what they were talking about when they claimed that calcium were, were buffers. Right? So you start wondering about the rest of their Amazing claims. Uh, about electrolysis, so basic idea, right? You've got uh, elect electricity applied, a potential is applied. One end, you're reducing water to hydrogen. There's your alkaline water forming. Other end, produce the oxygen as you oxidize the water. 
and great. Now, what they're claiming, of course, is to split this and isolate these units. So if you isolate the two halves, you get a buildup of your alkaline water, apparently, on the one side. The problem is, you can't just have a buildup of negative ions or positive. These things maintain uh, electrical neutrality. So for every hydroxide that pops up, there needs to be a, a counter ion, a positive ion that joins in. If you're separating your acid and your base, my only assumption then is that metal ions must be making the crossing. So perhaps calcium, magnesium ions that are there, great, okay, that's okay. Um, if you have lead uh, in your water, would the lead come across to balance it? You know, so they don't say, but something has to come across with it. Right? So I get a little concerned when you don't know what the other half of what you're drinking is, but it'll be whatever's in your water to start with. So, you know, there's a lot of weird questions about these devices, but they're huge. Uh, one of the popular brands is these Canjans. You get Canjan water. Um, and the neat thing I like about this, they make a special claim that nobody else makes. So they must be really good, right? Um, apparently, you've got two types of hydrogen, the atomic and the molecular being formed. You can't have atomic hydrogen atoms just floating in your glass of water. Right? They, they don't exist on their own stably. Those would be radicals, which apparently we're supposed to be getting rid of. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense there. But at least they acknowledge that you do have some molecular hydrogen. So a lot of really fantastic claims, no evidence backing it up. Uh, try looking through the literature to find any real clinical studies on this stuff. It's not much out there. There's some conflicting reports. Hard to judge which ones are really serious reports. Um, one thing that was pointed out was that, you know, if you're talking about enriched calcium and magnesium content as a result of that electrolysis, well, calcium magnesium is good for us. We need that in our diets. You know, but on the other hand, you, know, you get all that in a glass of milk, too. Um, on the upside, if you're interested in alkaline water, just go to your nearest faucet, right? Our water is alkaline here in Whitehorse. So if you're keen on it, you don't have to spend the bucks. But you know, once again, one of those things that you see making the rounds. Uh, related to ions, then is let's get them out of our water. Let's throw them into the air. Salt lamps. I've got one here. I've had it running for you know since everyone walked in. Right? Probably shouldn't touch that. I don't know. Um, this is great. This website posting. This was once again one of those social media posts. Um, how they help. Right? And science proves apparently that they help. So let's find out. Uh, some of the claims being made about I, I like them. They, they look great. Right? Uh, both positive and negative ions are all around. Fine. Fair enough. I'm not sure if everything emits them, but things do. I like the fact that they admit it's both positive and negative. Um, they get into talking then about suddenly we have an excess of positive ions inside and when there's no positive ions outside. No, 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 no. The ions outside are, once again, positive and negative in equal amounts. Except for occasions where a weather system moves in, thunderstorm, you may get imbalances then that then correct themselves. Right? Um, so they've got some strange claims are starting to make. Um, looking at this idea here, uh, everything around us, uh, sorry, the counter positive ions, the lamps. Apparently they're going to emit negative ions and get rid of those evil positive ones. All right. Um, they'll, they get rid of those, make you healthier. 84 trace minerals in your salt lamp. So I hate to say it, but unless you're planning on actually like taking a bite out of your lamp, uh, those minerals aren't doing much for you. The other thing that's neat, of course, those 84 trace minerals, most of them are metal ions, positive ions, that are apparently so bad for us. Right? So, um, interesting. But they do, I've seen analyses, yes, these things contain a whole whack of other, they're mostly sodium chloride, right? So, probably don't want to eat too much. Uh, they give you energy, apparently oxygen to your brain. Uh, radioactive waves, now, wait, we've got radio waves, you've got electronics, there's radio waves, your cell phone signals, your Wi-Fi, fine, there's radio waves. Radioactive waves would be something a fair bit different. Um, and last I checked, you know, we don't have gamma and beta radiation firing out of my Wi-Fi router, uh, right? So the term radioactive is different than just radio. Right? So, but apparently these ions will save us from it. Uh, radiation from our devices. Uh, once again, the ions aren't going to do much for the electromagnetic fields that are being emitted around us. If they did. Uh, my wireless mic wouldn't be working so well across this salt lamp that should be interfering with the radio waves. Um, just saying. And, uh, oh, they say, have them in your bedroom, apparently. Uh, I'll help you sleep better. I don't tend to sleep really well with the lights on. Um, though, keep in mind, all that energy you saved using the laundry magnets, you're now bouncing it off by using extra energy running your lamps. So, you know, you're breaking even. 
Uh, so, I mean, what's the, the whole claim seemed to be revolving around ions and the air. So I did a bit of digging just to see what I could find. Uh, first of all, I should say there's some basis here in actual application, right? The idea of electrostatic precipitators. You know, you've got your dust and smoke and stuff goes through, gets charged up in the first set of electrodes, uh, attracted to an oppositely uh, polarized plate, hits, grounds, poof, there goes all your dust and soot. Okay, cool. You can get household versions uh, that replace sort of the, uh, the, the filter on your furnace. You gotta clean them and once again clean the collector plates, but these products exist, they function, right? More probably related to what the lamps are claimed to do are things like ion generators, air ionizers. And the idea being you've got this device that's generating ions, passing uh, electrical uh, discharge through the air going through them and you're creating ions and spewing it into your room. And that's fine, I mean, if you get um, these ions happen to hit aerosol particles, you'll break those down. It will help to take dust out of the air. You get depositing on your walls and surfaces and stuff, right? So, I mean, these products exist. Uh, there are hospitals using air ionizers uh, because they seem to have some antibacterial uh, benefits. Now, once again, certain ones, I won't say that all of them do. So, that's fine, there's applications of this, but what about this whole good and bad idea, right? Well, some interesting studies uh, going back a while. So, I mean, this review article in 76 in Science talking about small air ions and their biological effects. Not a huge research field, right? There was a lot of really you know, bad claims made about air ionizers in the 50s, kind of put a whole you know, pall over the field. Uh, but there seems to be some reports, some evidence in the literature that they have effect. Interestingly, it's not though a case of, oh, only the negative or ooh, only the positive. It is small ions in general, because if you've got negatives, the positives are out there too. And so there seem to be some signs of, of biological effect, antimicrobial effect, things like that. Um, some other reports were looking at uh, corona discharge devices, so air ionizers, and trying to figure out what ions are produced. And that was my big snag with it, going, well, you're talking about air ions, what do you mean? Tell me what the species are. So they found you're getting uh, nitrate ions, uh, there's nitrate, nitric acid sort of pairings, bicarbonates. Uh, nitrates are oxidizers, by the way. All uh, right, so yeah, I can see how that would affect, you know, um, microbes and stuff, right? Sort of, you know, I, so all right, fine. That's interesting to see. Um, probably has to do with ozone generation being a part of the process. And that's one of the concerns with these. Uh, if you have a high enough uh, potential, high enough voltage, you can get ozone being produced. Um, there's been reports suggesting perhaps uh, superoxide anions might play a part in the antimicrobial action. Right? That would be a strong oxidizer. So it would, you know, kill bacteria. Um, and one report where they took care to sort of isolate their, their petri dishes and say, all right, let's put some guards protections in place and narrow it down. And they found that the ions didn't do much on their own, but if they were able to block out the ions and just let potential ozone through, they saw effect. So their suggestion is that, you know, in a lot of these other reports, the ozone generated with the ion generator might be the more active component. So there's interesting mixed messages in the literature, and that's fine, that's science. All uh, right, so there's maybe some good, maybe not, all right. Um, so it's an interesting field, and I mean, I got down, I, sp I spent, I think, two days just poking around the literature on this stuff. There's some pretty neat stuff. So that's fine, okay, so maybe there's something about the ions. But what about the salt lamps themselves? They emit boundless amounts of negative ions. Right? That's the whole basis of what that lamp is supposed to be doing right now. This is why we all feel so good in this room right now, right? That's that lamp. Right. Well, okay, a little bit about ions and ionic solids. Mostly sodium chloride, about 95% or so sodium chloride in the salt lamp. Sodium chloride structure, here's an example. Uh, the purples represent the sodium ions. Each sodium ion is surrounded by six chloride anions. Each chloride is surrounded by six sodiums. They have strong electrostatic attraction, very hard to break these apart. That's why these lamps are, and salt in general are so hard, right? Strong attractions. Now, that strong attraction between the ions also means it's got a very high melting point, 800 degrees. It's got a high boiling point, 1400 degrees. All right, I'll come back to that in a moment, 1400 degrees. The key, the reason I threw that on is if you're going to emit ions, you need to boil it. 1400 degrees, okay, that's been running for a while. That is coming in 19 degrees. Sorry, that 15 watt light bulb just doesn't cut it. I'm getting about 19.2 degrees off that lamp. And it's been running for about 40 minutes or so. Um, not quite 1400. So, right, we're not boiling it. Good thing, uh, 
the auto ignition temperature of wood is about 300 degrees. So probably just as well. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute. Water boils at 100. We're familiar with that. But 20 degrees Celsius water does evaporate. Right? It goes off into the gas state. Maybe the salts can do that too. Right? So that comes down to the vapor pressure of water. At 20 degrees Celsius, water has about a two and change, between two and three kilopascal vapor pressure. So some number of molecules can escape into the gas state and get blown away. You evaporate, not you personally, the water. Sodium chloride has a vapor pressure of 1.8 times 10 to the minus six kilopascals at 487 degrees. That's a million times lower than water at room temperature. That's not given off ions. Not at 400 degrees and certainly not at 20. So, neat idea. They look great. Um, they're not emitting ions, right? There's no way that ions are coming off those. So even if ions are useful for cleaning the air, that's not the way to do it. So, they're neat though, I like them. Speaking of things that are neat, this one showed up in my wife's Facebook feed, I think twice in the last six months. Uh, this one's a great, this video is, is fantastic. This guy, is, he's, a, he's a true believer in this device. He's got installed in his uh, old Ford, uh, I think it's an Explorer, an Expedition, one of the big ones anyways, and proving his gas mileage. It's a, it's a hoot, the video. Um, apparently he's saving 56% of the gas. And what it amounts to is he had this company uh, install this device in his car. It's pretty much a bottle of water with some electrodes in it hooked to his battery, he's electrolyzing it. He is producing hydrogen on demand. And the idea being the hydrogen goes into his engine and it burns and he gets amazing fuel mileage. And there are a lot of different schemes online for this. Do-it-yourself schemes, companies selling products. Okay, this is a, actually a fairly popular idea. And we want us also want to stick it to the big oil companies, right? So let's create our own hydrogen. So it's interesting, I went to the webpage, let's see what they have to say about this product, right? First of all, and that video, that testimonial, he, he repeats a lot of these same points. He, the guy's great, it's a hoot to watch. Um, internal combustion engines are only 20 to 30% efficient at burning their fuel. Um, not quite. Uh, yeah, if it's cold outside, if you're heavy on the gas pedal, fine. You have some unburned fuel gets through. Not everything burns. You're not throwing 80% of your fuel out the tailpipe, right? Uh, what they're getting at with this, and I think what they're misquoting, is that when you look at the energy released when you burn fuel, only 20 to 30% of that is converted into driving your car. The rest of it is lost through heat from the engine, it's lost to friction, uh, other system losses. Okay. So it's not the burning of the fuel that's inefficient, it's how we use it. Uh, apparently we're burning two gallons of water from the air with every gallon of fuel, sorry for the imperial measurements, I didn't uh, think to convert. Um, I don't know, that seems a little high, maybe it's really humid. I'm not too worried about it. I do think though that I don't, the water vapor doesn't do much in terms of actually the burning process. Right? That's a product of combustion. Uh, it's not going to burn any further. So, all right. Uh, what we've got here, we've got, um, you know, he's adding these gases that they're producing t to the fuel. Um, hydrogen atoms are not going to adhere to your fuel. Um, the hydrogen molecules you produce also will not adhere to your fuel. Hydrogen is a surprisingly unreactive molecule. You know, we think about, ooh, hydrogen, because, you know, we've seen pictures of the Hindenburg. Um, yeah, it burns, but it's not very reactive. You know, when we use it for hydrogenation, to attach it to, uh, to take alkenes and convert to alkanes, uh, we're using metal catalysts to enhance the reactivity, but hydrogen doesn't do much on its own. So it's certainly not sticking to our fuel. Um, right, to talk about water in the engine. This is interesting, because just uh, a week or so ago, I saw an article, uh, automotive news story, um, talking about water injection into motors. And BMW and their new M4 GTS has got this technology, they're p looking at it in their one series cars as well, where water is sprayed into the air intake and into the cylinders. Uh, it helps cool the engine down, it helps cool the fuel air mixture, you get better density, uh, allows higher compression ratios. Neat technology. Um, so this, that's something that they're playing with. It improves efficiency and horsepower. Apparently they used it in World War II in uh, fighters give them a bit of a horsepower boost when needed. Apparently there's some maintenance required after the fact. But, so that's neat, but they're not talking about that in here. They're talking about hydrogen they're producing, right? You know, the part I really like about this story is they give us numbers. So often you don't get solid data, and here they provide some data. Uh, 12 volts from your car battery, one to three amps, current going through. So 
the potential, the voltage is important. Uh, you need at least about one and a half volts for electrolysis to work. They got 12, they're way clear of that. So good, I'm gonna give them benefit of the doubt. Let's assume the electrolysis is working 100% efficient. The amps, the current is important because that gives us a sense of how much hydrogen we're gonna make. So let's do some math. All right, so power used, just taking their numbers, they're using about 36 watts of power to run their electrolysis. The reaction, the chemistry, electrons, water, we're getting our hydrogen gas. Okay, that's the part we're gonna focus on. So taking a look at that three amp current, uh, three amps translates across to, well, three coulombs per second. There's 96,000 and change coulombs per mole. Moles, I'm not talking about little rodents. Uh, moles is like the chemist's dozen, right? Uh, dozen's 12 eggs. Uh, a mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23. Uh, particles. Um, think of it as six with 23 zeros after it, right? That's lots. So we're producing, for every second, 3.11 times 10 to the minus five moles of electrons going through. Now, two electrons for every one hydrogen means we get one and a half times 10 to the minus five moles. Works out to be about 31 micrograms of hydrogen produced every second. Woo -hoo. Um, 31 micrograms seems really small, okay. At 20 degrees Celsius, that would be about 0.4 milliliters of hydrogen every second. All right. So we're producing some hydrogen, fine. But what does that mean in terms of the combustion? Well, combustion energy, about 286 kilojoules per mole. There's the moles of hydrogen produced. We're firing out 4.43 joules every second. A joule per second is a watt, 4.43 watts. You put in 36 watts, you get out 4.43 watts. Okay. Probably not a great fuel mileage improver. Um, right? Should point out, uh, just for some other comparisons here, uh, at this rate, the 4.43 watts, um, to get as much energy out of this system as you'd get in eating a chocolate bar, you'd have to have the system running for about 68 hours. All right, so just you know, put that into some context. So yeah, doesn't quite do what they say. But, you know, I, I like this because we had data. Uh, so in the end, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of these different things out there, these different uh, claims, they pop up. A lot of people like them, we're excited about them. It sounds like the great miracle cure, right? Let's, let's buy that medicine from that traveling road show. Um, but, you know, when you start digging, uh, if you can find the data, find the information, uh, you start seeing that a lot of cases, yeah, they've got nuggets of truth. They've got some real fact tied in there, but then way out of context, right? Um, so in the end, you know, just be aware, you know, if you've got some revolutionary new medicine, you know, someone's got the secret that the oil companies don't want you to know about, uh, you know, maybe you've got to take a closer look. Apply some basic science. I'm a big fan in believing um, basic science education is a way to avoid a lot of these sorts of um, marketing scams and, not marketing things, scam things, separate items here, please. Um, right, so I'm a big, big, big fan of that. And really, you know, I think Carl Sagan said it best when he said that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And most of the claims online don't quite meet that, uh, that bar yet. But thank you for your time. I think we've got a microphone that's going around. Excellent, great, thank you. So how, is, how has this all changed in the age of social media. I, I mean, this, the snake oil people have been out there oh, for better, yeah. a long, long time. And these, all these fancy devices were out there 40, yeah. 30, 40 years ago. So how has it all changed with social media now? I think one of the big things, it, it, it gets around so much easier now, right? There's, there's a bit of an inherent trust, I think, in social media in the first place. People trust their friends. So if the friend likes it and posts it, it gains momentum a lot faster. These things, I think, will circulate a whole lot more quickly. And, and it propagates. So combined with social media, just the fact that anybody can throw up a website. And, and no kidding, I mean, I'm trying to look up some of the stuff online. You do a Google search, and you know the first three or four pages of results are all saying exactly the same thing, right? So um, certainly gets a sense that you're seeing a lot of false evidence, right? Where it's easy to believe people, well, look, I'm finding all this information. There's pages and pages of this. this must, there must be something to this, right? So I think just the rate at which it propagates and, and builds up and loops back on itself, I think is really the big change. But you're right, I mean, um, a colleague of mine sent me a, uh, a clipping uh, from a paper from 18, 
late 1800s, selling um, galvanic belts, pretty much in magnetic therapy, but you know. So yeah, you're right, these things, a lot of these are not new ideas, but they, they've got legs. And you'd like to think with all this information at our fingertips, you know, we wouldn't get fooled by it because the information's out there, but um, the, the, the self-supporting stuff seems to all just build up faster than the, uh, the actual just raw science. Do actually, do air ionizers actually work? You know, trying to find that out, eh? and it's, I can see why they would uh, to a degree. Certainly the idea of being able to break up aerosols, airborne particles, things like that. Uh, I think there's definitely the science there that makes some sense. Whether or not the ionizers produce significant amount of ions and they actually, you know, get out far enough from the device. Um, you know, the ones that are sort of those recirculating filter precipitator ideas course now you're pulling air through you can see definitely that those fungi I mean you can you actually see the dirt coming out of them right um, but it's hard to know really how well they work um, probably there's something to it. they probably do a little bit at least but I mean there's when I mean, you get ionizers that plug into your USB port that's gonna be a very different beast than one that plugs into a wall outlet just the, the amount of power available anyways um, so I would say it's certainly not all created equally um, whether you know, certainly there are reports out there, there is, and there's literature out there that supports that they seem to have some antimicrobial um, benefits, at least the ones tested. But once again, why is that? Uh, a little, they're a little bit light on the, the mechanism behind it, and that's where I get concerned. You know, I really want to know, well, how does it work? Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are apparently hospitals that have used them in, in burn units and stuff. Um, so, I mean, they, they seem to have, there's some possibility anyways. But yeah, it's hard to find real, just solid, solid information unequivoc unequivocally. Yeah. But I certainly wouldn't rule them out yet. Yeah. Any other? Yeah, Ernie, I uh, got quite a kick out of your soap and detergent uh, talk because I used to work at Lever Brothers years ago. Oh. <laughs> and they had, uh, I think they had three detergents at, at one time, and they were all supposedly different, right. but they were all uh, the same chemical. Yeah. And they were blown in a tower at different uh, specific gravities, and then they put a different perfume and a different color in them. Right. So there was a lot of smoke and mirrors. Sure, yeah. <laughs> And I think you were right on. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, you mentioned uh, science education, basic science education, mm -hmm. um, as a way to um, counter this. Like, sorry, I, I've I've got a four-year-old, and I'm just kind of wondering, like, what that means. Right. Like. Do you know what I mean? Like I, yeah. I took physics 11. I took wine science yeah. in university. Like that was. Yeah, and it's it can mean a lot of different things. I think first, I, mean, I think young children, I think are naturally curious and interested, right? So I mean, just having it available and, exp and you know, being able to be exposed to it is part of it, uh, but it goes beyond just that 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 interest at that age. It, it goes it carries through because I mean you can you know get through high school and graduate without really doing much beyond a grade 10 science, right? So there's a lot of just. What, what I consider basic, you know, the, the stuff, you know, certainly the grade 11, 12 level, first year university level, that um, explains away a lot of this. And it's, there's a lot of difficulties with it because some of the concepts get a little dense, right? And trying to present it in a way that's accessible, you also run the risk of um, misrepresenting things, right? And it actually can be very challenging to give someone uh, a basic understanding without simplifying. Um, personification, we get that, the idea that people talk about, well, molecules like to do this and atoms like to do that, and of course, they don't have personal preferences. It's an easy way to speak, but you know it hides a lot of the uh, what's happening behind the scenes in a way. So there, it is it is a challenge, and I think making it available, especially especially for for youngsters, you know, four year old, five year old. I mean, just even getting their hands on, just exploring, you know, playing with you know vinegar and baking soda, right? I mean, back when film used to come in containers, you know, that's one of the things we used to do as kids is you know baking soda and and vinegar in the container and throw it out, and go, you know, and yay, it's exciting, right? Uh, things like science fairs, of course, are a great way to get um, you know, young people involved and interested in science. That whole idea of getting out, trying, exploring, you know, learning from that experience. 
I think that's what gets a lot of the interest. Um, but there's also something, it's weird because, you, you know, I've met people who go, oh, I'm not a science person. Oh, science, I don't want to, you know, I don't, oh, I don't want to science. You know, there, there's this, this stigma associated with science, which is another part of it, you know. And, and, and some of the stigma is probably rightfully earned when you have, you know, you know big spills and disasters and, and things that happen. I mean, I can see where some of the stigma comes from. Um, but on the other hand, it's, there is this, this fear and mistrust of science to a certain degree. And I think just making it an acceptable uh, part of life in general, it's just it's an everyday thing. It's all around us. It just, it is, right? And I think that's probably a part of it towards as well. It's not something to be afraid of and to avoid. Oh, I'm, oh that's it. I'm not taking any more science courses because, ooh, I don't want to have to work that hard. I mean, you know, um, anybody can do science, but maybe sometimes the way we teach science isn't conducive to people who are just interested in it. And I think that can be part of the challenge as well. But just to uh, add a little bit to that, I mean, science is one of the basics is having a fundamental skepticism. Yeah. And uh, you don't have to te teach that in just in science classes. Yeah. And it, it, I think, you know, the whole science is just a process of trying to acquire a certain insight into capital T truth. Yeah. It's a process to get in that direction. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> the, the whole um, business of charlatanism, do you have any idea about how much money ch actually changes hands in this whole game? And, and both through direct sales and also the advertising revenue that these websites get. I mean, th th you don't have to sell anything to actually make a lot of money now because of the advertising side of social media. And well, that's true. That, that's true, exactly. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know any numbers on that. That's a really good point. Yeah, I mean, it's these things get a lot of attention. And, and I felt... <laughs> a little guilty looking up things for this talk because I know I'm clicking on websites going, oh man, this is going to show up my browser history, you know, never mind <laughs> advertising revenue. So yeah, you know, um, they do, they get a lot of attention. So yeah, there's, there's probably a lot of money to be made. And of course, these companies can come and go because if one, you know, gets sued because the product doesn't work, well, then they just come up with under another brand name and push the same product through it. And some of these, you know, uh, ones online you find, they've been going for years and years and years. And yeah, they just keep rolling brand names. And um, no, yeah, I don't, don't have numbers on it, but it feels like it's huge, and that's what's kind of scary. <laughs> but, you know, and... Um, I haven't been really involved in a lot of the, the peer-reviewed <laughs> science articles and everything in, like, the last 20 years, basically, since the Internet was just kind of starting. <laughs> and there was no social media at that time. And all of my research was in the stacks in the university library looking up the articles and the journals. And now when I find if I try to research something online, because I don't have access to a library um, to go and see firsthand articles, it's really hard to access those articles and the journals if you don't have a membership yeah. or some kind of an inroad to see that data and, and the research, but all the garbage yeah. is like free and easy and so yeah. accessible. So yeah. I'm just wondering, because I'm not like in yeah. science so much anymore, is there any discussion around making all of that real information yeah. more accessible to people? No, you're right, that's a huge barrier. Um, it's a barrier even to, to us at a small school. You know, we're certainly not a, you know, UBC where we have, you know, access to all the journals. And it, you're right, it's a huge barrier. Uh, a lot of stuff's hidden behind paywalls. And um, there is a push in several fronts. Uh, open access publishing is a big one. And there are some very good open access journals, so everything's free. Um, the big problem, not the problem, but the challenge, the way that changes uh, the ball game is that the pu these uh, author, the researchers have to pay to publish their paper. So it uh, just changes where the money comes from. But that's a nice way because then anyone can read it. At the same time, because of the way open access policy sort of is developing, you also have a lot of really questionable publications out there. They, they look legitimate, they look real, they sound real, and you get some really questionable research that'll make it past review because the review might be one person. Uh, I've seen times where the person who actually is the lead editor for a journal published something that they claim was peer reviewed, but it was went from submitted to accepted in a span of like less than a week. And peer review takes longer than a week. 
Um, so, so yeah, there is open access is a big one, and it's it's slow to get late. So the life sciences seem to be a bit faster moving. Uh, physics has the um, archive A R C H I X. Anyways, their their physics their archive it's a preprint server, so they've got um, actually a pretty neat source there. Um, chemists, I hate to say it, seem to be a bit slow to get on the the open publishing uh, bandwagon, unfortunately. Um, so that's one one way of it. There's some there's some good just general science websites as well that will um, report in sort of less detail, but at least give you some decent information. Um, it's tough though because even if you can read abstracts, sometimes the abstract doesn't tell you much or it's misleading. Right? And you see that even with a lot of the um, sort of the, the, the sham science out there where they'll quote something out of an abstract from a real article, but taken out of context, um, it means something completely different. Right? No, no, it is tough. Um, there's been a bit of push as well in. I know in the UK they've had a push towards research that's funded with public uh, money, so anything that's come out of you know, a government-run grant program, uh, there's now an expectation that their results be published open access. So the taxpayers who paid for the research can actually read the results. So there is definitely a movement towards that kind of access. Uh, it's slow, it's slow though, and you're right. The, um, it, well, it's almost like food, right? The junk food is easier to come by and more affordable sometimes than the, the, the nutritious stuff. Just a side comment, There's Google has a specific search engine uh, dedicated to articles and everything like yeah. that. It's scholar.google.ca. I have no idea how useful it is, but I do know it's available. Yeah, yeah Google Scholar is a, is a neat search engine. You're right, it'll focus you down to just the, um, what it deems literature. Um, I saw a report ooh, a few months ago um, they were looking through and they found a lot of actual really questionable, so what would they call the uh, predatory uh, publishers uh, coming up as hits on the Google Scholar as well. So, so Google Scholar is good because it does focus you down. Um, you know, you're not getting people's Facebook pages, but yeah, it's, um, you still have to be careful uh, in terms of the, uh, the quality of publication it turns up. But yeah, no, it's a, it's a great, it's a way to search the literature just with a cautious eye. Uh, there seems to be a lot of money to be made out of high-energy um, uh, drinks for sports and all that yeah. lot. I mean, is, is that all jazz, or is that is there any truth to that? Yeah, it's <laughs> no, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, mm. certainly, I mean, you get some of those, some of the stuff I've read about. I mean, I say it's not not a field I'm really familiar with, but certainly some of the things I've read suggest that in the extreme cases, there's some benefits, you know, re replenishing electrolytes and stuff like that. But certainly at the level that you know, any of us would be at playing a sport, you know, a glass of water is going to do you just as well. It is the stuff from the stuff that I've read anyways, but um, I think there's a certainly a certain amount of hype, you know, with any of those sorts of products. If they worked as well as they said, uh, they wouldn't need the splashy ads and the, uh, you know, the, the fancy commercials. But I, I just wanted to sort of follow up on that, the sort of critical thinking theme that's mm -hmm. been running through this. Um, it seems to me that we need to uh, have more of an emphasis that on that, like teaching people how to be, how to look at things critically and, be, and to be skeptical. You, know, you don't really have to be, I mean, you don't have to be a scientist yep. to see some of this stuff is, is, uh, there's a bunch of lies in there. Yeah. So, you know, how do we teach people to be better uh, critical thinkers and to sort of be logical about how they look at the, the claims these things are made. I mean, are making, how do, I mean, do we teach enough of that in the schools? I wonder. Yeah, I think certainly in some cases, you're right. I mean, there's, it's probably tough. You know, teachers have enough to cover in their, in their curriculum in the, in the school system. I'm sure it's hard to throw another thing in, but I know they try, right? There, there are aspects to that, um, you know, case study type work and, and to be able to use that critical thinking. Uh, you know, we, that's one of the things we strive for in general in post-secondary education is that critical thinking skills. Um, but it is, it can be tough because it's sometimes it's, when you're new to a field, it's hard to know, you have that confidence to, to question, right? And I think part of that is just encouraging people to question, you know, it's okay to ask those questions and, and look at the evidence and, and go where it goes. And, you know, and sometimes you get fooled. Like sometimes there's something you think, there's no way this could work. And, you know, if the evidence shows it, all right, that's, that's the way it goes. And, and I think it's, it's partly practice and it's partly being modeled. It's, it's partly, um, you know, you know, starting from a young age, you know, um, children seeing that, you know, 
people not around them not believing just blindly whatever they hear, right? And, and asking those questions and pointing out where the, the contradictions are, right? And so I think part of it's modeling, part of it's just experience and practice. But yeah, it, it's a huge thing, and it's something that, it's, it's, it's actually every part of life, right? Not just science, like you said, you know, um, you know politics, the news, uh, right? All of that. And um, yeah, sometimes it seems to be that people aren't willing to, to want it. I think there's something comforting about people just to believe. And I think that's, you know, part of the challenge. All right. Well, thank you, Ernie. Okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, I'm happy the microphone seemed to work with the run. I was worried. I was worried yet. Yeah. <laughs>